evening, good evening, good evening. I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and secondly to encourage each other in the Lord. I think we all could agree that these are difficult times but also we could equally agree based upon the evidence of Scripture that God is capable of sustaining us even in these difficult times. So we have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to, to get anxious about. In fact, the Bible said that we should not worry and we should not be anxious. Instead of worry, we should pray and call upon Jesus Christ. And so as such, uh, we are here to encourage you. And in so doing, it is our custom to make sure that we have a short on a daily basis that we will encourage us in the Lord and to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So again, I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. Yes, we have a great show for you. We are continuing on the exposition of the book of Acts, but clearly we are on a divine mission. And clearly, human beings are not equipped to deal with spiritual things. So as such, we have to ask God to guide us going forward. So as such, I ask that you now bow your head with me while I ask God the Holy Spirit to direct us going forward. Heavenly Father and our God, we want to present ourselves to you right now. And we're asking that you would do two things with us. First, you will use us to glorify you. And then secondly, secondly, you will use us to encourage each other. Oh God, you're worthy to be praised. You're God all by yourself. And secondly, oh God, us as your people are living under the curse and the stress of, this, of sin in this sinful world. And so we constantly need to be in touch with you. We constantly need a blessing from you. We constantly need to be encouraged and to be uplifted in you. So, Lord, we come before you now. And as we do our duties to worship you, we pray, O oh God, that you will strengthen us and give us strength to move on in this sinful world. Be with those, O oh God, that are sick. Those that are mourning, those that are lost to COVID-19 and other illnesses. O oh God, strengthen us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, we want to welcome you to FSM Daily Digital Show. At this time, I want to call upon Brother Wayne to give us a special music and to encourage our soul in the Lord at this point. Brother Wynn, please. Way over yonder. Is a place that I know where I can find shelter from the hunger and cold and the sweet taste in good life. Is so easily found way over yonder. That's where I'm bound. I know when I get there. The first thing I'll see is the sun shining golden, shining right down on me. Then trouble's gonna lose me, worry leave me be. And I'll stand up proudly in true peace of mind. Talking about, talking about way over yonder. 
is the place I have seen in a garden of wisdom from some long ago dream and maybe tomorrow I'll find my way to the land where the honey runs in the rivers each day and the sweet taste and good life is so easily found way over yonder that's where i'm bound way over yonder is a place that I know where I can find shelter from the hunger and cold and the sweet taste and good life is so easily found way over yonder that's where i'm bound oh way over yonder that's where Thank you very much, Brother Wayne. Indeed, we appreciate we appreciate that beautiful selection. If you notice, the first word that we what we see here now in Acts chapter eight is Saul. Saul was in hearty agreement with the putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. Remember in Acts chapter 7, we dealt with Acts chapter 7 last night and last night's show, that it shows Stephen, and the Bible said it was filled with the Holy Spirit, and when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the religious people then stoned him and killed him. And the Bible makes it clear now in Acts chapter 8, the first word, Saul. And as time goes on, it is very important because you're going to discover now when we reach to Acts chapter 9 that this very Saul was later converted and wrote and responsible for 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament scripture. And so that is very important here as we continue. But again, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. That's Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions. Except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen. And made loud lamentation or loud crying over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering the house, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. And so Paul was a part of this um, group, this religious sect. The son Andrew consul. Paul was a scholar among scholars and a young man that has great potential 
if you may, to continue in that issue. But I, I want to call your attention now to the fulfillment of the very scripture. Do you recall in, we already done an exposition on Acts chapter 1, particular verse 8. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, one of the promises that was promised to the disciples that when they experience the Holy Spirit, then they must share the gospel in all the world. And so, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This is in now Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you recall it's in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit came up on the church. And so even before they received the Holy Spirit, as they were in the upper room, the 120 disciples awaiting the Holy Spirit to come upon them, one of the instructions that in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, it's about when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem and in Judah and in Smyrna, and even to the remote the remotest part of the earth and so that was their instruction uh, in getting a little bit more information to share with us i did a little research and i look at the Se seventh day adventist summer school quarterly the adult lesson that was written and printed i mean available to the church in 2018 from july um, to september um, of 2018 and here what the main contributor of that quarterly um dr wilson um, shared with us he said indeed scattering throughout judah and Smyrna, the believers went about preaching the gospel the command to witness in these areas acts chapter 1 verse 8 that just read to you was then fulfilled and so in here now in chapter 8 after they stone stephen in chapter 7 what came from it he further went on to say the triumph over stephen ignited a massive persecution against the believers in Jerusalem no doubt instigated by the same group of opponents the leaders of the group was Saul who caused no small damage to the church in Acts chapter 3 to um, also 26 10 the persecution however has turned to good effect. He continues to write, the Samaritans were half Israelites. Even from the religious standpoint, they were monophysists of the acceptance of the first five book of Moses, the Pentateuch. In other words, they, they believe in the first five book of Moses, the, you could see them even as the Muslim faith who accept the first book of Mo, first um, five books of Moses, or even the uh, the Judaism, the Jewish faith who accept the first five book of Moses, but they don't necessarily um, hold the, the New Testament scripture in that re, in that high regard so those were um, those group of people and who live in that area practicing circumcision that was one of the things that Moses required for help except accepted the Messiah to the Jewish however or to the Jews however Samaritan religion religion was corrupt which means the Samaritans had no share whatsoever in the covenant mercies of Israel. And so this is a part of the reason why the Samaritan was an uh, outcast. Even if you recall in Jesus' ministry that Jesus met this woman of, at the well. And so this particular woman was from this sect of the Jewish community where she was a Samaritan. And, and that's the reason why there was so much bias 
even during Jesus' ministry among the Jewish folks because they see them as, uh, as, as half shoot, if you may. He continued on to say, the unexpected conversion of Samaritans, of Samaritans they couldn't believe. They were stunned. They couldn't believe um, that they were supposed to be a part of a, the, the church. So the, dis so the disciples sent out Peter and John to assess the situation. God withhold the spirit until the coming of Peter and John. We're going to talk about it more in Acts chapter 8 verses 14 to 17. was probably meant to convince the apostles that the Samaritans were to be accepted as full member of the community of faith. Furthermore, so now let's picked up now here and continue into the dialogue. You recall now as I share with you that at this point Stephen was killed and Stephen was buried by some people that were faithful to the gospel. And so here is Stephen now been killed and buried but out of something bad came something good. It is a, as if this coronavirus, if you look at this coronavirus, where the devil have caused so many lives, and but also the devil didn't have his own way. <clears throat> the amount of people who had this virus, if God was not as was merciful, would have lost millions of people. So in spite of the fact that we lost almost a million people, we could have still lost even a billion people in this world because this virus is that deadly. So we need to still find time to give God praise. Out of something bad, God permits good to happen. And so likewise, my brothers and sisters, Stephen now, who's now been stoned and been killed for the gospel. Now look now as we focus on this passage and then we enter into a dialogue. So therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching in chapter 1, verse 8. But God affirmed and said, listen, when the Holy Spirit come upon you, you need not just to preach the gospel in, Jude, in Jerusalem, but you need to scatter around to your fellow um, cousins, the Jews, and then you need to take it all over the world. And so by killing Stephen, believe that they will silent the disciple and they will silent the gospel. Now it helped now to motivate and spread the very gospel. So just like the COVID-19, so many of us just go to church and sit in church and do a really the participate in the ministry. And right now, we are now using technology to advance the gospel. In fact, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, this is a good passage I want you to read. It said, in the last days, knowledge shall increase. And this knowledge increased by us having better knowledge of a scripture. But not just by us having a better understanding of a scripture, but God also increase knowledge in giving scientists knowledge to establish um, software so the gospel could be preached in all the world. You could be in New York or Connecticut or Brazil or Jamaica or Africa and you know last night show someone communicated with us all the way from Africa and said listen I want to let you know that we're watching it live. So people are now communicating the gospel all over the world. And so the church was so stuck inside the four walls of the building. And so far we have in the gospel just talking to ourselves. And God wants this gospel to spread all over the world. So sometimes God is now using even this virus to do great good. God does not cause the virus. It is from the devil. And all who are work to stem the, the virus are on God's side. But the point that I'm making is this, just the way Stephen death and they believe that they will stop the gospel, it fulfilled the very scripture where they 
And likewise, we now who are stuck in the church and so selfish with the gospel, we're now doing more to share the gospel with the entire world. So the devil believed that he was going to stop the gospel, but we see that he's a loser. So verse 5 says, Philip went down to the city of Smyrna and began proclaiming Christ to them. In other word, is proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ deserved to be worshipped. So the crowd went one accord in the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. As they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirit, in other words, in the case of many that were demon possessed, there are a lot of people in this world that we claim that there are mental illness, that some of them are demonic. And so as such, Philip now is now casting out these spirits. They were coming out of them shouting with loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now there, now there was a man named Simon, or Simon, who formerly was practicing magic or witchcraft in the city, astonishing the people of Smyrna, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to great, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called a great power of God. My brothers and sisters, look, pay close attention here. This man was performing demonic, a demonic work. This man was doing evil. But people associate him with doing good. If we're not under the influence of Jesus Christ, if we're not under the influence of God the Holy Spirit, we will call evil good. So these people who never know who God is and never familiar with the Spirit of God, this man was performing witchcraft, he was performing demonic work, and they associated with being good. The passage continues. And verse 11 he said, And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonishing them with the magic arts. But when they, be well, when they believe Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women, like even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So this very man now, who was demonic, who people believed that he was doing something great, came into the presence of Philip, recognized that that which Philip had is superior to what he had. And as such, he attaches himself to Pete, um, to Philip, and accept the truth. Now, in verse 14 to 17, I want to show you now a contrast. If you remember, I shared with you, um, Dr. Wilson shared with us that the Samaritan um, was a different type of Jew, or a, um, in, they weren't as the other Jews that were in Jer Jerusalem. They didn't believe in all of the Old Testament scripture. They believed in the Pentateuch, the four, first five books of Moses. And so it come now where they had an issue. They sent John and Peter, rather, John and Peter to check out what was going on. He had received the word of God. They sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So even though those people now 
come to the realization that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is God. Remember, the Samaritan believe in the Messiahship. They believe that someday Jesus Christ will come and died and cover a cross. And if you ch check what Stephen was sharing with them when they crucified Stephen by stoning him, what Stephen was really saying to them, when you came out of Egypt, God brought you out of Egypt and God promised the Messiah. Further, what Stephen showed them the history when David was a powerful king and David, then Solomon, then Solomon concubines set up for pagan worship in Israel. And as such, God was so upset with Solomon that God permits, when Solomon's son took over the kingdom, God permits the kingdom to be divided. And so the Samaritan were among the first of the 12 tribes that were scattered all over the world. And so as such, they didn't continue in some of the custom of a northern tribe upon which Dave, um, Daniel was a part of a northern tribe in Babylon. So there is a split between the nation of Israel, the Samaritan, and the Judean. There are two different issues. But if you notice now in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Holy Spirit, our God shared with them that when you experience the Holy Spirit, you must make sure that you witness also to the Samaritan. So Philip now on a missionary journey, and as Philip was preaching, the Samaritan accepted the faith. So the established church now, the New Testament church now established in Jerusalem, as such now they sent Peter and John. And verse 15 said, who came down to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. My question to you now, have you received the Holy Spirit in your life? Have you received the Holy Spirit in your, life, in your life? You know that there could be many people that are in church and don't have an experience with God, the Holy Spirit. And that's why some of church, some church people are so wicked. Do you know that there are more war caused in the name of God than anyone else? War by so-called Christian. Some of the cruelest people in the world are church folks. They have no heart. And the reason why some of those folks doesn't have any heart and cruel, and sometimes they stop good meaning or good heart people from joining the church because they become gatekeepers and people who love to come to church refuse to come to church because they make a calculation. They're saying, if you're so evil and you'll be in church, I don't want to have nothing to do with the church. But the reason why some of these people are so evil, it is because they have not, they have yet to experience the Holy Spirit. They have yet to receive that which God desired to give to them. So in verse 16 he said, For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And verse 17 said, Then they began laying their hands, this is Peter and John, on their hands and said, And they were receiving the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ wants to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit because he knows that we need it. He's not here to teach us. So the Holy Spirit is the ultimate teach, um, teacher. So quickly in verses um, 18 and on, and then we enter into a dialogue. So in verse 18 of your Bible, it said, now when Simon saw the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Follow me now, my brothers and sisters. 
saying, give me this authority to me as well, so that everyone whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon was a businessman who deceived people with a demonic spirit. And he was accustomed to in trickery. But he, when he discovered that Peter, rather Philip, was preaching about Jesus Christ, he came to the realization, to the head knowledge, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's a part of the, that group who believe in the Messiah. And so they now make the nexus after Jesus lived a perfect life, died on Calvary cross, resurrected and went back to heaven. So as such, being a part of their custom, they believe in Jesus Christ. But they miss the understanding of who Jesus really is. And they did not experience the gift. So because of it now, he went back into his business mode in terms of deception, not really converted. So he said in verse 18, rather 19, saying, give me the authority to me as well, so that everyone whom I lay hands on may receive it. In other words, he wants to offer money for the Holy Spirit. He wants to pay money to get the Holy Spirit. But my brothers and sisters, you cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot buy your way into... You know, there are so many people in the church that are not qualified to be in position that shouldn't be there in the first place because they're not converted. But because of proxy power that they're there. It's like having a person become a leader of the world that is not qualified. And when you put a person that's not qualified to lead over people, they make decisions that will kill us all. May God help us. And so we are now in a position where he's trying to pay to receive the Holy Spirit. Now listen to how Peter responds to him. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before God. God deals with the heart. Is your heart right before God? Is my heart right before God? Are we just plain church? You see, my brothers and sisters, when we are plain church, we are acting up, we are occupying space where other people would come, and because we are not converted, we are, we are hindering other people from coming into the church. Peter looked at him and said, Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of yours, of your heart, may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourself. So that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. My, my brother, do you see, and sister, do you see what's going on? When this man that was accustomed to do wickedness, and still on his path to do wickedness, when he was confronted by the man of God, Peter, who is now filled with the Holy Spirit, Hear, hear what his response is. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourself, so that nothing of what you have said come, may come upon me. Is this your prayer today? 
Is this my prayer today? When God has shared with us the word of God and appeal to your heart, do you reach out to God and say, God, forgive me and surrender to God? This man was a practicing witchcraft and was doing all type of magic and all type of things that was anti-Christ. He first came to Jesus Christ by head knowledge. With head knowledge, you recognize that Jesus Christ is God and he believed God. There are many of us here that we only follow in Jesus because of head knowledge. But we are not converted. For us to be converted, we have to have an encounter with God the Holy Spirit. So when Peter confront him and share it with him, he cried out to say to Peter and call upon Peter. And Peter prayed for him. Let's enter into a dialogue around what we have discovered thus far. Because as you know, this show is the show is all about a dialogue where we reason one to another. What says you in respect? To what has been shared here so far in the book of Acts. Listen to the dialogue. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, I, from the reading and the exposition, I can see clearly that the Holy Spirit is working, acting, and doing good in different communities and taking the gospel to the entire communities. Uh, yes. Where that, there are people who are searching and eager to find God. And when, when, it, when, when the Holy Spirit is brought upon them and the gospel is brought to them, we see them accepting it and being baptized. That is, that is, indeed, that is indeed the truth. What I find to be fascinating thus far um, is a clear distinction between the acts of the disciple and the acts of the Holy Spirit. You notice that it, the ultimate actor here and the one, the main actor here is God, the Holy Spirit. If you notice in the case where Philip, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, went to preach and as spirit, spirit as he preached to um, Simon, and many of his, um, those of um, the Samaritans, they come to the realization of the head, with head knowledge that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah. Because their history based on Dr. Wilson is that they, they believe in circumcision. They believe in the Messiah. In other words, they are a part of the Jewish that still look forward to one day that the Messiah will come and redeem humanity. So they believe in that. The first five book, books of Moses. But there are many traditions that they never, they, as, a, as a group, they didn't keep. So as such, the Jews in Jerusalem see them as uh, outcasts to the point that they weren't mean much to them but however when the Holy Spirit came upon Philip and when Philip went to Smyrna to the Samaria and he preached the gospel in Samaria they accepted the gospel and they, when they accepted the gospel the, the church now established New Testament church upon which Peter and John were two of the main leaders. They sent them now to, to this group there to talk with them. So when Peter get there, Peter discover that while they have the, the head knowledge of Jesus Christ, they weren't aware of God the Holy Spirit. So when they went and prayed for them, then they experienced the Holy Spirit. They experienced the Holy Spirit. And by experiencing the Holy Spirit now, they not only have Jesus Christ, the world's Redeemer, 
and the God who created heaven and earth. But they now have the promise according to our theme text. Um, John chapter 16 verses 5 to 15 that Jesus promised them God the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth or into deeper truth about Jesus Christ and so when they have the truth now they will be able to have the full knowledge of what God intend to communicate to them and while there many much need more to be said and so likewise how is that applicable to you and I it is as if knowing about Christ intellectually. But what the Holy Spirit does, it gives us more than just knowledge of who God is. Head knowledge is not sufficient. We need, our hearts need to be converted. And so the Holy Spirit now does the conviction. And as I share with you, one of the reasons why the church is in the position where it is in terms of you no know, spirituality within the church and is a lack of love is the absence or of the, the Holy Spirit that convict us of who God is and who, G, who Jesus is. And so we have the full package, not just in knowledge of God, but the character traits of who God is, that God is love both in name and in deed. I have a question. What is the distinction with after being baptized, they believed in Christ Jesus when they heard the message, then they were baptized. What is the difference with receiving the Holy Spirit? What caused the difference? Is, was it the prayer? That's a great question. And let me make sure that I understand what you're saying. And the audience also are clear on what you're would really you, saying. Would you like me to rephrase my question? Yeah. Are you saying that what... Please, do it again for the sake of your audience. Because it's a, it's a, in, in the context of doing the exposition and this passage, your question hits at the core. So restate your question, please. Okay. Once an individual yield their life to Jesus, accept him and believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, and have been baptized, what is the next step to receive the Holy Spirit? Actually, what causes the Holy Spirit to fall upon someone? Why did the believers in Samaria did not receive the Holy Spirit until Peter and John had come and prayed for them? Um, in the context of the text, it serves two purposes. The first of this that they never fully understand, even when they baptize in Jesus' name, they never fully understand the fullness of who Jesus is. Because if you notice the Holy Spirit, all the Holy Spirit does is confirm Jesus' ministry and let the people understand, in fact, Jesus is who he say he is. And so they never fully have a full understanding of who Jesus really is in the first place. And so they were growing in knowledge. And just like us, um, sometimes we don't fully understand who God truly is. We're still learning about who God is. But also, what God also want to demonstrate is in, even in that very process, Jesus now uses use it as an, as an example or an illustration or a demonstration to teach all of us. First of all, those that were living in Samaria, those um, that were with John and Peter, and also us. And so... What, what am I saying? Let's unpack uh, what I share with you. Number one, God also want to demonstrate the different role, roles of, of the Godhead. If you notice in our key text, our key text, which is John chapter 16, verses 5 to 15. In uh, this very passage, Jesus convey a powerful message. 
first Jesus said that I must go. Rather, rather him says um, he, he makes sure that he is he's come to testify of him who sent him and he, that him is the Father. So Jesus demonstrates that, hey, I come to testify about the Father. Then Jesus continues and saying that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, is going to testify of me. Then Jesus further went on and say in the passage, again, is John chapter 16, verse 5 to, to 15. Then Jesus further said, what the Father has is mine. And so he's showing the oneness between him and the Father. Then he said, the Holy Spirit now will testify of me. So what Jesus has done now is have established now the significance of what the doctrine is called the Godhead or the Trinity, where God play one God that plays three different roles. Where Jesus, for example, came and he died and Jesus could just be in one place at the same time and the Holy Spirit now could be simultaneously with you wherever you are and with me where I am. And so he established now the Godhead. And so likewise, this also demonstrated where they first believed because they believe in the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is in the Messiah. But God also want to convey now the, the, um, the Trinity or the Godhead and to say, now listen, God work in this manner. And so by Peter come, and when Peter pray, it is now show them now also the knowledge now of God the Holy Spirit and the promise of Jesus Christ. But it also does more than that. It also fulfilled the prophecy that in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that said, When the Spirit come upon you, you need to share the gospel with this very group. Because there were segregation. It, it was equivalent to the United States of America in the 60s and 50s, where you have two different water fountains where the black were drink from one fountain and the white drink from, uh, from the other fountain, especially in the south where I'm living now in Georgia. These are racism, a lot of racist tension here. And so it's the same ten, um, dynamic with those group, um, the Jews as a people here. So what God is doing now is breaking down the barrier and saying that salvation is for everyone. Salvation is for everyone, and in so doing, is also showing the, oh, the Godhead and, the, and the, uh, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And also, to, uh, it was also a witness to Peter as well, and John as well, because it also opened their eyes to see that the gospel is not just for them, but the gospel was also for those people who live in those eras where society is seen as second class. So you see how your question now hits at the core of so many different um, dynamics and to so many different moving parts that at the end of the day point to the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, conveying to the people the importance of the Godhead, the three in one God. And in so doing, he also making the nexus that it was the same Jesus Christ who spoke to Moses in the wilderness. But uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Any other thought? Any other question? I I have a question. Sure. Is head knowledge um, absolutely it's essential though to receiving the Holy Spirit? I want to focus on the experience of Simon who thought that he could receive the Holy Spirit by silver and then when it was pointed out to him that it couldn't happen that way, it seems that there was an instant acceptance of, of Christ at that moment, you know. So I'm just wondering if individuals who decide in a moment <clears throat> uh, for whatever reason that they um, will accept Jesus for who he is. Does the Holy Spirit descend upon them at that time? I, I want to make sure that I could 
I answer you. My, my microphone, for some reason, um, was not clear in hearing the, the, um, the gist of your question. But I'm going to try to summarize it. And tell me if, 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 if I hear this clearly. Are, are you saying that, uh, in, in honesty, my, my, my system had a little bug in it. Uh, it just worked. Could you mind just, just state, restate the question again, please? I didn't hear you. Please. No, not at all. Okay, so you were saying that um, just it seemed to to uh, indicate that head knowledge isn't isn't enough, and also, uh, I guess I'm going to put my question in two parts. If you if you study to gain head knowledge of who Jesus is, um, then does the Holy Spirit automatically automatically come upon you? Uh, in that process. And also, I wanted to focus upon Simon when he thought that he could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by purchasing it with silver. Um, he was reprimanded, and then it seems that he had an instant change of heart, and it seems that the Holy Spirit descended upon him at that time, and it wasn't because he had necessarily studied about it. So it seems to be too areas whereby the Holy Spirit enters an individual. And I wonder if you share that opinion. Yes, I, I do. I, I affirm that, opi uh, uh, that opinion. Um, what, in other words, I, I, I learned my last semester or my second to last semester in seminary that human beings have six need. First, six needs. First, we have a God-filled void that we have a spiritual need inside of us. We also have needs to be developed intellectually, secondly. We also have needs to be in good health, physical health, third. We have need um, um, socially. We have to have a good relationship with each other. We also need to um, develop intellectually and emotionally. And so all of those areas is how God communicates with us. So the reason why we are intellectual beings because we're created in the image of God. So God do want us to have head knowledge and intellectual knowledge of who God is because we're intellectual beings. But that is not sufficient. For example, one could have the head knowledge to the point they have one or two or three different PhDs in theology and know about the subject of God and still that person or people are not converted. And so what this demonstrates in affirming what you said, we need more than just head knowledge. We need to also to be converted. And so what, one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays is not just to give us head knowledge, but also to give us to the knowledge that we have a God-filled void, that we have to surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. And so as such, what, when Peter explained um, to Simon uh, at that point, Simon had knowledge now of now increased and also he, he get more than head knowledge. He discover now that this is now more than just head knowledge or economic um, for him because he coming from a background where he will do those demonic stuff and people will pay him. And so there's a business aspect for it for, to him. So as such, he now was willing to offer money to get that power because he sees things that he could accomplish with such power. And so what Peter said, listen, this is not for sale. This is a gift from God. And so he was humble enough to permit God, the Holy Spirit, to convict him. And one of the key, what we need to understand here, God could give us enough wisdom, both head knowledge and conviction, in a second or in a millisecond, that which it takes us all of our life to learn, if we're willing to adhere and to listen. So as such, 
in just in that moment, he were able to say, listen, that which is offered here is of the Spirit. And he opened his heart and received the Spirit of God. And as such, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And so that me need to teach us a lesson. Number one, head knowledge is not sufficient. Is it important? Yes. But also, it's also demonstrate that the moment you surrender to Jesus Christ, is like turning on a light switch and the room was dark and when you turn on the switch it becomes bright in that second God can transform our life and so that is a clear example of the miracle and if I could conclude this way sometimes we want God's God to do great miracles raise the dead and he often do that sometime heal the sick and he do that sometime but one of the greatest miracles is how God can turn sinner into saint in a matter of second. And likewise, that is what have happened there. That's what have transpired there um, where Simon in a moment, in a second, in a conversation with Peter, have now switched from darkness to light. I hope I have answered your question. Very much so. Thank you. Okay. Good evening again. I just wanted to make an, uh, a comment on something I observed. Where it concerns Simon, he did accept, but when Peter told him after he offered money to purchase the Holy Spirit and Peter rebuked him, he did not show any repentance himself by going and praying and asking God to forgive him for what he had done. He told Peter to do it. And we cannot, we cannot pray for repentance for someone. Every individual is responsible for their own repentance. So he did not show a repentative spirit there. He asked him for prayer. But if we need to repent and ask God for forgiveness, we have to do it ourselves. And Simon clearly did not do that. If, if, I could, if, if I could show another side of the coin there, um, that's one way, that's one school of thought. But I would like to add another side to it that could add to it and complement what you're saying. It could also be that he recognized that his spirit is upon Peter and said, please pray for me. If example, you could also see that in light where someone reached to the point in their life when they, they, they discover that they're far from God and call up on the pastor and said, will you come and pray with me or pray for me? And so you could see it from that angle where he recognized that, wow, um, if I am so far from God, and if you know more about the Holy Spirit, because if you notice in the text, he said, he said in the text, he said, hey, um, please pray for me so that which you saw in me or that which you're predicting does not fall upon me. And so you can see that now of, of him saying, you know, you are correct. And I don't want to be I don't want to be um, touched in a, such a way, so why won't you pray for me? So I just want you to kind of be able to look at it from that angle as well. But th that's a good thought, you know, because we are, we, we have to see it from not just one angle, but from the wider angle. And in the text, it seems to be um, clearly suggesting that. Any other thought? But that's a great thought. We're just adding to what you just said. Anyone else? And if I, if, if there's no, um, if there's no, no question at this time, let me, let me also um, share a thought with you in respect to that as well. If you, if you look further in what, if you look 
in the context of what's going on in terms of the role of the Holy Spirit. What Peter have made clear here is that the Holy Spirit, there could be people that have been in the church all the days of their life and are not converted. If you notice, Simon was, first of all, engaged in Ritkoff or doing things that was simple but demonic. He came to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And now he transitioned from that what he used to do and he's now become a, a part of a local congregation. And he believed even upon Jesus Christ, that he is indeed the Messiah. But he never experienced true conversion until the Holy Spirit came upon him. If you notice that God permits Peter to have this discussion with this man, is that correct? Can someone talk with me? Yes. Was it Peter who was having this discussion with this man? Anyone yeah. can affirm that? Yes, yes. It was Peter. Yeah. It's not by chance where God permits Peter, and not John, and not any other disciple. It's not by chance. If you notice, Peter could identify with this situation because Peter was with Christ for three and a half years learning of who Christ is, had, a, had, had knowledge of Christ, and was not converted. Jesus himself said to Peter, Peter, the devil desired to sift you like wheat. In other words, the devil knew that Peter was not converted and wanted to kill Peter in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus said to Peter, I prayed for you. And then Jesus said, when you are converted, strengthen your brother. And so if you notice now when Peter came, Peter know this by example in his own life. He know what it is. Uh, in, in fact, both of them have that name, Simon. He know that situation. And so he said to him, hey, my friend, may God deal with you if you don't get converted. Because he know Peter could live in both worlds, rather lived in both worlds. First, he was with Jesus and have a knowledge of Jesus Christ, just like this, this person who from that culture who believe in the Messiah. And now as such now, when Peter encountered the Holy Spirit, Peter is the one speaking boldly. And so this man now see what's going on and he said, Peter, pray for me. Now, talk to those in the church now who have been there for years. When you talk to some people in the church and when you listen to their conversation, you just know that they don't convert, they're not converted. I, I recall I was assigned to, a, um, to a, a church and I was doing some volunteer work and trying to mobilize the church. And one day I was there actively um, engaged in trying to move, propel the church forward. And then one person said, you know what? There's someone came and asked me to use my legal authority to get rid of you. And I was so shocked when I heard it. Because they saw that what I was doing, maybe I was usurping or some position that they wanted. And you would think that if someone is trying to move the gospel forward, everyone will come on board to assist to go forward with the gospel. But people see differently. And so they spend their time fighting for position. They spend their time doing something that has nothing to do with expanding the kingdom of God. It is because, simple put, they're not converted. And it doesn't matter if they're elder or deacon or member or pastor or leader. If you're not converted, you're just not converted. And so as such, what you see here, my brothers and sisters, is a difference between a, having a head knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and know Jesus Christ for yourself. 
And so now you know who know better. Because I know a lot of us, when we look at some people that are in church, we make it executive decision and say, listen, you're a deacon in church, you're a pastor in church, you're an elder in church. If you are that in church, then you stay right there, I will stay where I'm at. And all, all often time they discourage you who want to be sincerely worship God in spirit and in truth. But I just want to let you know that God wants to do something great even for you. Because by converting you, God just may use you to convert them. Mm -hmm. To lead them to Jesus Christ. So there's no excuse. All of us here are way in the balance, are way in the scale and found wanted. Unless we give our hearts to Jesus Christ. So maybe you now, God wants to convert you so you can help them. And as we progress in the book of Acts, when we begin the first word in chapter 8, we see a name say Saul. Then as it, in verse, verses 1, 2, and 3, we notice now Saul who was there as a leader to help to have them to persecute Stephen and to stone Stephen. This Paul, who had a head, head knowledge of who God is, thought he was doing the right thing, was on a mission to destroy the church. Sometimes we believe what we're doing is in the best interest of the church, and sometimes our actions are demonic and we destroy the church. But when Paul get converted, as we will see in Acts chapter 9, you will discover now, Paul, who was there persecuting the church, become the leader. He became the leader of the church. And so likewise, some of those people that are in church, sometimes they're not converted and living ungodly. Sometimes God want to convert you and use you to help them. Because when we get to heaven, there's going to be no starless crown in heaven. Meaning that you, at some point, are going to influence someone's life to get there. And someone else is going to influence someone else to get there. So in other words, someone going to influence me. Someone going to influence me. And I'm going to influence someone. And you're going to influence someone. And someone going to influence you. My question to you. Who are you influencing to the kingdom of God? Do you know that God has assigned you to reach some people? But well, first of all, God wants to change you and I. And then when God changed you and when God changed me, then God wants to use us to reach someone else. So there's two questions. As we, if there's any further question, then we'll enter into a, we will end transition into the last segment of the program. But there are two challenge, two challenges that I have for us. My first question to us is: Are we absolutely sure that we are converted? Meaning this: If you should drop dead right now. If you should get hit by a stray bullet right now, if we should get picked the arm of the coronavirus now and we have the last moment to live, are you 100% sure that your soul is well with God? If you, if, if, if you don't know the answer to that, if you don't have the assurance that that is so, then you need to get on your knee and you need to cry out to God. Because God will not only save us, but he also give us the conviction and the assurance that we are saved. That's number one. Number two, if you are saved, if you experience the Holy Spirit, who is it that's on your mind that God is saying to you, you need to tell of Jesus Christ. You see, a converted person is a person that's on a mission for Christ. You're on a mission to tell someone else 
that there's no other name on heaven and earth upon which you will be saved. Uh, one could be saved except through Christ Jesus Christ. Except through Christ Jesus. That's a converted person. So you receive it and you impart it. Uh, you receive it and you share it. That is the clear indication that you are converted. Because one who is converted must have to share it. Because it's, it's like fire in your bone. You can't stay still. With that being said, is there any prior request among us? Yes, please. I would like us to continue to lift up all our prayer warriors. We have a uh, number of the prayer warriors have uh, losses in their immediate family and are still grieving and trying to recover. So I want to lift up all our prayer warriors, continue to lift up the teachers and the students, our frontline workers, doctors, nurses, first responders, because the COVID has not been stemmed as yet. And it is just as serious as when we just discovered it in March. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I'm going to ask you just to bow your head with me. Mrs. Jenkins. I'm here. Would you mind pray for us, please? Yes, I will pray. <clears throat> Our dear Father in heaven, um, we're just so thankful that we can, we have the opportunity once more to bow in your presence and to know that you hear us and that you love us and that you're not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. We're so thankful, dear Father, for the gift, that precious gift that you're offering to all of us, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Please, dear Father, grant that our minds may be open, ever open and receptive to the voice of your spirit and that we may constantly be led by your spirit and that we may come to know you better and better each day and realize the great and inexpressible gift of salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Father in heaven, many of us are hurting. Many of us are anxious. Many of us are concerned. There's so much going on in the world today, but you have promised to give us peace. You have said, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We trust in your promise. We rest upon your words. We want to lift up the prayer warriors that have been praying for this ministry, but yet themselves have gone through just unspeakable difficulties and trials and the ultimate trial of losing loved ones. We pray, dear Father, that you will comfort their hearts and bring them that peace that you have promised. Walk beside them, hold their hands, and help them to know that you are their constant friend. Again, dear Father, thank you for this ministry. Thank you for your love. And thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, 
Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mrs. Jenkins. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is about to come. I want you to look at what's going on in this world. These are the last days that we're living in. Just look what's going on in this world. This entire world is crippled, is lame by this pandemic. And though even the leaders in the most powerful country don't know how to deal with it. Not just that, but things that are going on in this world that leaders of this world are convinced they know deep down in themselves that they cannot resolve it. In fact, the best thing some of them can do because they're not converted is lie to us. That is not as bad as it is. But it's bad. These are clear signs. If you read Matthew chapter 24 from verses 1 to 13, pestilence, this is a pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places, fire, wildfire. I was listening to uh, a, a news clip from our president of the General Conference um, was saying that we need to pray for the wildfire in California, etc. And we just know that given what's going on in this world, that we live in, in the last days of this world history. But the Bible said all these negative things that's going on around us is not contingent upon the coming of Jesus Christ. The only one is, and it is the proclamation of the gospel. What is the gospel? That Jesus Christ is more than just a good man. That is, that Jesus Christ is more than just a prophet. That is, but that Jesus Christ is the one who spoke this world into existence according to Genesis chapter 1. And that Jesus Christ is the one who promised to come and die for us in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And then this just same Jesus Christ spoke to Moses and said, I am the I, that I am. Tell Pharaoh that I am the I am who have sent you. And this same Jesus Christ who Moses couldn't um, look at and he had to, he hid Moses in the cliff of the rock and Moses only could see the back of him as he passed. This same Jesus now miraculously came, became man. For God to become man, that is a mystery. This same God that Moses couldn't see him, that Moses would be consumed. And when the people, when Moses came off the mountain and the people saw Moses, Moses had to veil uh, himself for the people couldn't see the brightness of Moses being a man. This same God became man and lived among man and yet man did not consume. Eternity would not even give us enough time to unpack how God became man, became man. This same Jesus Christ who died and conquered death, who laid on his life and picked up back his life after he finished his job, promise us God the Holy Spirit and give us God the Holy Spirit to convict us even of our sin right now. It is the Holy Spirit that will speak, that spoke to Peter. It is the Holy Spirit that spoke to Simon. And this same God the Holy Spirit is with you and with me right now if we permit him in our hearts. But God is coming again, and we'll put an end to sin. Death itself will die. The only thing that prevents Jesus Christ from returning is to make sure that you have a fair shot, an opportunity to, to accept or to reject. So in other words, this is your moment. What would your answer be? Would you give your heart to Jesus Christ? Would you give your heart to Jesus Christ? So God can seal you for his eternal kingdom. Or will you reject him? It is my prayer that you will do so. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. We're a part of the Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist World Church. We have a church in pretty much every nation under the earth. 
we could direct you to a church that will continue on these very teaching, a church home. When Jesus finished his earthly ministry, he also established a church so people can continue to grow in him. You, your family, your children, your offspring could have a church home. Please call this number and we will direct you um, to a church home where you can continue to grow in Christ. And also, if you can be of a blessing to this ministry in one of these five way areas, we're asking you to do so. You can become a contributor. You can donate to us financially. You could do, invite someone to be a part of the show. Please do your part because in so doing, Together, we are building up the kingdom of God together. Until then, thank you for being here. God bless you, and so long.